Well, welcome back. Uh, today we're going to start the first of three mini lectures on biological psychology. And we'll be looking at just overall broadly looking at the field and looking at what, it's, what it entails, what methods are used. Uh, things of that to give you an overall idea of where we're going in this class. So first, biological psychology um, is called a couple different things. A lot of people say biological psychology. Some will call it behavioral neuroscience. They're the same thing, so don't, don't let that get to you. So what this is, is it's essentially the study of the biological basis of psychological processes and behavior. So what we mean by that is how do we think? How do we perceive the world? Um, how do we explain mental disorders? Things like that are explained by biological psychology. So we're trying to understand the underlying biological mechanisms that affect and um, allow us to behave or allow us to think or to experience things. Um, so where does behavioral neuroscience come from? Well, neuroscience is actually a broader field that encompasses all of the nervous system. So it's not just about behavior, it's, you know, it's broader than just behavior. So behavioral neuroscience is just one piece of neurology, one piece of this larger system um, that you can look at as well. So biological psychology um, or behavioral neuroscience can be kind of viewed either as a part of psychology or maybe even as a part of neuroscience, depending on how you look at things. And it is a broad field. Um, one of the reasons this course is required here at uh, Mississippi State, and one of the reasons it's required for the graduate students by APA standards, is um, biological psychology affects virtually every discipline within psychology and psychiatry, in addition to many other related medical fields. Like one of the um, experiences I had was, you may remember I mentioned that I worked on a cancer unit for, some, for, for a year. And one of the greatest challenges we had with working with those patients was treatment adherence. So to do it right, there were a lot of things these patients had to do that were difficult. And you know, for instance, one of them was um, after having the chemotherapy and having it knocked out, knocked out their immune system, they weren't allowed to leave the unit for a month, which is really, really hard. And it's especially hard when you have someone who is a smoker and they really want to go outside and smoke, which is pretty much the worst thing you can do with no immune system. But, um, but that was part of the battle is you couldn't prevent people from doing that. We couldn't stop them from going out if they wanted to. So how do we how do we try to you know prevent that? How do we try to help people make the choices that would really benefit them? Well, that's kind of what where um, this area of behavioral medicine here. That's where this comes into play. Is it's trying to look at how um, psychology and behavioral techniques meld with medicine to try to help both areas. So here, this is where behavioral medicine would come in, where it's how it's an opportunity for psychologists to work with medical doctors in order to try to improve the treatment they're getting, or they're giving rather, by improving the adherence of the patient. So all in all, the main point of this slide is just to get at, there's an interplay between biology and psychology that's important to more than just psychologists. It's actually important to many different fields. And actually it's part of the reason why psychologists are being incorporated more and more into medical units because we're being recognized more and more as very important parts of providing medical care. So how do we study the impact of biology and behavior? Well, the book outlines five main viewpoints, which are really strategies that are used. Although biological psychologists will only use one or two of these strategies often, um, it often requires knowing all of them in order to fully understand the relation between biology and behavior, assuming we can never completely understand that relation. So the first strategy is describing behavior. So this is similar to creating an operational definition. It's knowing what you're targeting, what you're looking for. 
So this can be done in two ways, either structurally or functionally. Um, and the debate between these two goes back to this very beginning of psychology, but we'll leave that for now. So structural is examining the movements, the behaviors, the components of whatever you're doing that are involved. So for instance, the structural examination of speech may look at tongue position, mouth position, things like that. Um, a functional approach is looking more at the context of the behavior. So why is this happening? What purpose does it fulfill? So with that, with speech, maybe right now I'm, you know, I'm recording a lecture. So the function is to give you information. So you can see kind of the difference. It's a structural approach to what I'm doing right now. It's looking at, you know, maybe my positioning, the way my mouth is moving, things like that, the nuts and bolts. Whereas the functional approach is looking more at what's the function, why am I doing this? So that's the first step is understanding why the behavior is occurring, which is really important in order to understand any behavior. The second part um, that the book focuses on is studying the evolution of behavior. And the book really focuses on evolution, but honestly what this really boils down to is the difference between species. Um, so for instance, if you have two species that are similar or have a similar ability, let's say it's songbirds, maybe you have two birds that can do these elaborate songs, but one, one bird cannot. What you can then do is look at differences between those two, maybe for instance the brain, looking at differences in different parts of the brain to try to figure out what may be responsible for the differences between these birds, or maybe differences in vocal cords. So really, when it comes to evolution, as far as our purposes, where it really informs biological psychology, in my mind at least, is looking at differences. Uh, the third piece is observing the development of behavior over the lifespan. So this is called ontogeny, O-N-T-O-G-E-N-Y. It's the process by which an individual changes over the course of their lifespan. And this is a really great way to study biology and behavior, because what you can do is look at, you know, as things change, as our biology changes, as things mature and maybe degrade, what changes behaviorally do we see? So it helps us get an idea of the relation between biology and behavior. For instance, one of the things we'll talk about a lot coming up is um, sensitive periods for, for instance, learning speech. Well, there's certain, um, without going into too much detail of it now, you'll get it later. Um, there are things biologically that happen during those periods of time that enable for that sensitive period to occur. And when that goes away, then that sensitive period also passes. So. With that, looking at development, looking at how things change within the body and the relation with changes in uh, behavior can be very helpful in understanding um, biology and biological psychology. The fourth piece is studying the biological mechanisms of behavior. So this is looking, we have really nuts and bolts, what are the biological processes underlying behavior? So one of the ways that I think this makes the most sense is think about different injuries. So think about Broca's area, Bernicke's area, and the aphasias that happen because of those. So that's where you can look at, okay, this area of the brain is responsible for this behavior. And if, if you have damage here, then you don't have this behavior. So it's a really nice way to understand the relation between behavior and biology. Uh, you can also look at differences between people with or without a condition. For instance, we'll talk a fair amount about schizophrenia and how individuals with schizophrenia will have larger ventricles than those without schizophrenia. So you can look at differences between individuals and also look, kind of like what we talked about with the songbirds, um, look at differences in biology to try to understand, um, understand the mechanism of these different biological pieces and how they affect behavior. And um, lastly, like most every, uh, most every other area of psychology, one foci of biological psychology is to improve the human condition. 
And one of the ways of doing this is by understanding the biological correlates and causes of behavioral dysfunction and how to rectify it. So, in other words, looking at how we treat problems using this information. So, part of how we learn about the relation between biology and psychology is looking at when things go wrong, how do we treat it? And why do these treatments work? And this is a great way to learn about biology, because, or biological psychology, rather, because that's how a lot of what we learned has come from. You'll see as we go through this course, a lot of the, um, a lot of our advances are actually things that we've learned by accident. Uh, the serotonin hypothesis with depression, that was not, that was a post hoc. That was not a hypothesis that came out of them that tested it. That was we gave a medication that increased serotonin in the brain and people felt better. And we learned about the brain through that. So we often can learn a lot about biological psychology through studying when things go wrong and how we treat them. So there are a couple interventions that are often used. So we're we'll, we'll going to talk about three main ones. Somatic interventions, behavioral interventions, and correlation. So in somatic interventions, we alter the structure or function of the brain to see what happens. So you know, this is done often in, in um, lower animals, where you dissect the part of the brain and then you see what happens. But it can be done with humans as well, using this technique here that you see called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. And this, what it effectively does, it shuts down a portion of the brain while humans are awake, and it's a safe thing to do. And in doing this, you can learn the impact of that part of the brain. So you shut down part of the brain, and you see what happens. So it's a way to look at when you take out a certain part of the biology, what effect do you see behaviorally? So those are semantic interventions. When you look at how changing biology affects behavior, somatic intervention. So a couple examples of this. So this should be like um, administering a hormone, so that's changing our biology, and looking at mating behavior, or stimulating a part of the brain and looking at differences in um, movement and you know, working toward a goal. So again, changing biology to affect behavior of somatic interventions. A behavioral intervention is where you um, change the behavior and look at how it changes the structure or the function of the biology. So this is kind of different than what you typically think of. Um, because you may be thinking, how can I change my brain by what I do? But you actually can, and we'll actually talk about a lot of ways your brain changes depending on what you do. But think about this scientifically. How can someone modify um, their biology in a way that we can observe through behavior? Well, we actually do this a lot. We do this in fMRI studies. So that's where you put someone in a scanner and you're seeing what parts of their brain light up, what parts of their brain are active, depending on what they're doing. So actually, that's a behavioral intervention. What you're doing is you're actually having them do a task, so you're having them do a behavior, and looking at how it changes the biology. So here are some ideas of you know, how a behavioral intervention could be viewed. So for instance, maybe a behavioral intervention is putting a male in the presence of a female and looking for changes in hormone levels, or um, giving someone a training and looking at changes in nerve cells. So what you're doing here is the interventions on the behavioral side, it's on what you are doing, what you're, um, yeah, what you're doing, and you're looking at changes in the body. So somatic is body changes affecting behavior. Behavioral are behavior changes affecting the body. Make sense? Correlation. Um, this is a measure of how much two things relate. And as you know, correlation does not apply causation. So um, I mentioned the serotonin hypothesis earlier. So what we know is that serotonin levels are correlated with mood. We know that for people who are depressed, they usually have low serotonin levels, though not always. And also we know that giving 
judge that increased serotonin in people who are depressed seems to help mood. So what, we're, what we see here is just the relation. These two things seem to move together. It's not causal. It's not saying that giving more serotonin causes better mood. Um, all we know is that these things seem to be related. And part of the reason we know this isn't causal is if it were, SSRIs would work for everyone. Um, that's not the case. And in fact, let's see, you typically have to go through several SSRIs until you find one that works well for you. So it's not causal, it's correlational. But in looking at relations and looking at how things are, you know, move together either um, positively or negatively, we can learn about how they may influence each other. So a couple examples of some um, correlations. So brain size and learning stories. We'll talk about this later, but for a long time there's been this hypothesis that um, the larger the brain you have, the better, the higher IQ you have. And there's some relation there. It's not as strong as some scientists used to believe. But yeah, you know, like okay. hormone levels and strength of mating behavior. You know, you hear all those ads recently for low T, you know, low testosterone in men. Well, part of it is because if you have low levels of certain hormones, um, certain behaviors and mating behaviors are going to decrease. So again, that's a correlation. And also enlarged ventricles, like I mentioned earlier, and symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, this can happen, it, but just because you have enlarged ventricles doesn't mean you have schizophrenia. We'll, we'll look at examples of that later as well. But we know that these things are related, and then knowing that, it can help us understand the underlying mechanism of these problems or behaviors. So in sum, Biological psychology seeks to understand all these relationships. So somatic intervention, so we want to see how biology affects our behavior. We want to see with behavioral variables um, how changes in behavior affect somatic variables. So that would be a behavioral intervention where you change the behavior to look at changes in biology. And then you have correlations just looking at how these two things relate.